Well, we identified four problems on the Texas Medical Board. And those of you who are from Texas, probably the bulk of this crowd will recognize some of these names. Initially, we identified the four problems as Keith Miller, Donald Patrick, Roberta Califoot, and Mari Robinson. Those are the people we identified as the four problems. Since we started to complain about the medical board, since we started to point out what was going on, since we started to point out the abuses of power, since we filed our lawsuit, three of those four people have left the medical board. Keith Miller is gone. Yeah. Donald Patrick is gone. Roberta Califoot just resigned in December. And she resigned four days after a hearing in our lawsuit in which I pressed and moved for the court to order the medical board to turn over the copies of the original complaints that have been filed against all these doctors in Califoot's field and in her area out in Abilene, Texas and spilling over close to Dallas here. There are nearly 20 of them. And I've moved the court for the judge to order production so we can see who actually filed those complaints against Califoot's competitors. And the court has not ruled yet, but it was four days after that hearing that Califoot resigned. So she's gone. Mari Robinson's the only one who's left. She's the interim executive director, executive director, and she's not a doctor. Now, how does that strike you? The executive director of the Texas Medical Board is not even a doctor. They can't find a doctor in the entire state to serve as medical board. Sure, they can find a doctor to serve in that important position, but they haven't done it yet. And Rick Perry needs to hear from all of us uh, that we deserve a physician as executive director of our medical board. It shouldn't just be an attorney who's bent on trying to prosecute, enforce, discipline doctors. It should be someone who actually went to medical school, actually went through what you all went through, right? The huge investment of time and money um, I know what it's like. My wife went through it. I've got relatives who went through it. The years that went into getting your medical degree, getting licensed, and just on a whim, medical board can take that away without any due process. It's outrageous. They couldn't put you in jail for two days without providing all sorts of due process protections, yet they can destroy your whole livelihood, your whole career can go out the window without any of the due process that's given on an ordinary basis to people who even receive traffic tickets? It's not right. It doesn't make sense. So we have proposed a number of reforms to the Texas Medical Practice Act. And we are embarking on a lobbying effort to change the rules by which the medical board operates. And we're asking for the support and help of everyone in this room and beyond to pass these reforms. And I'll go through them, and I think you'll agree that they're all big improvements. And we have an opportunity in this window of time when the Texas legislature sits, which is just from now till the end of May. And really, the bills have to get lined up well before the end of May. So really, we have to push hard this month and next month to get this bill and these changes in line so they can be passed before the Texas legislature adjourns at the end of May. And then Texas legislature does not sit for another two years. Texas is one of the states where the legislature only sits six months out of every two years. It's nice, actually. <laughs> Wish we had a legislature like that in New Jersey that only sat six months out of every two years. But this is the six-month window we're in. 
And if we could just get some of these reforms passed, it would make a huge difference. It would be very beneficial. And we've gone through the whole code, and we've come up with a lot of really good zingers that I'll share with you right now. And this is in order. This is Title III, Health Professions of the Medical Practice Act. The first one that comes up in, in the order in which the code is written is we propose an advisory commission, a new commission where people could complain about the medical board when it does abuse its power. That would be section 152.0021. And this new commission would have oversight so that the medical board would know that it is accountable when it abuses its power. Until now, there's been no accountability for the medical board at all. We had one legislative hearing in which the medical board was forced to answer questions by legislators, and that was very effective. Very effective. And that's the first time they've ever had to do that. Until then, they thought they were above the law and didn't, weren't accountable to anybody. The governor hasn't been watching them. They're, the courts don't provide any check and balance on their power. Well, an advisory commission would be a good, good mechanism to bring some accountability. And, and there are many other agencies have advisory commissions. Why doesn't the medical board? Something that could sit in oversight and uh, request records and force them to answer questions about how they're doing. We have, we've added a provision about conflicts of interest. As part of the lawsuit, it came out that one of the top disciplinarians on the medical board, Keith Miller, was receiving a check each month from Blue Cross Blue Shield. I mean, that's unbelievable to me. Blue Cross Blue Shield has an interest in disciplining doctors and in getting them to lose their license. In many states, what an insurance company will do is if they have a big backlog of payables to a certain doctor that they don't want to pay, if they can persuade the medical board to revoke that doctor's license, then by law, the insurance company is no longer obligated for any of those bills the doctor submitted. And there's a case of a doctor in another state where she had payables that were owed to her, accounts receivables, owed to her by the insurance company that totaled about a million dollars. And the insurance company then went to the medical board to get her license revoked. And then it doesn't have to pay any of it. I mean, that's, that's an easy financial decision, right? You save a million dollars just by making a phone call and telling the board to go after somebody. And of course, we'll get into this, but in Texas, you never learn whether it was an insurance company that complained against you. They keep that confidential. You never learn the identity of who filed the complaint. And we're gonna change that too. But here, we've hit the top disciplinarian, Keith Miller, was getting a paycheck from Blue Cross Blue Shield every month while he sat on the board and while he was disciplining people. This came out in the deposition. And I can read you right from the transcript here. Um, question, I asked this question of Keith Miller. I went out to Center, Texas to depose him in our lawsuit. And they told me not to drink the water while I was out there, by the way. <laughs> Question, so you have been serving for Blue Cross Blue Shield for 15 years, approximately. <clears throat> Keith Miller's answer, yes. My question, do you get paid for that work? Keith Miller's answer, yes. My question, how much do you get paid? Then the attorneys just went ballistic on the other side. Wait, I'm gonna instruct the witness not to answer the questions on personal financial matters. And then they had another attorney. They had a whole room full of attorneys. Another attorney, same instruction. And I had to, end up, I had to go to the judge to, to force him to answer that question. And it turned out it was not a lot of money, but it doesn't take a lot of money to create a conflict of interest. And that was something I learned from that deposition. Insurance companies, they don't have to throw a lot of money to get someone to tilt in their favor. And of course, Keith Miller would deny that he was influenced by that, I'm sure he would deny that. But in the legal profession, those conflicts of interest are not tolerated. It doesn't matter whether they deny it. If a judge were receiving money from one side of litigation, he would be disbarred, he'd be hounded off that bench, 
might go to jail for doing that. Now, if that's the way it works for judges, why do we tolerate a system where medical board officials are getting checks from insurance companies while they sit in judgment on doctors? Completely inappropriate, in my opinion. So we've proposed a change to the law that a person may not be on the board if he or an immediate family member is receiving any compensation by any entity that has a financial interest at stake with any license holders, including insurance companies, regulatory agencies, pharmaceutical companies, or malpractice attorneys. Keith Miller was serving as an expert witness for plaintiffs in nearly 50 malpractice cases. So he's out there making a lot of money. I think it came out that he was making 300 bucks an hour as an expert witness for the plaintiff who's suing doctors. Now imagine if you're defending a malpractice case and you're sitting there before the jury and the plaintiff's expert takes the stand, what do you think that plaintiff's attorney's first question is going to be? It's going to be, expert, what are your qualifications? And this guy is going to say, I'm a top disciplinarian on the Texas Medical Board. And he's got the jury eating out of the palm of his hand. Whoa, the expert for the plaintiff here sits on a medical board. He must really know what he's doing. He, I mean, the governor wouldn't let him sit on that board if he wasn't good, right? Yeah, right, well, <laughs> yeah. Okay, now, people who file complaints. Our change is that no complaints will be accepted unless they're under oath. Nobody should be able to complain against a doctor unless it's sworn to and notarized that the complaint is true. As it stands now, somebody can file a complaint and make everything up, and nothing's going to happen to them. Nothing's going to happen to that person at all. You can put that doctor through years of misery, cause him to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars defending himself, and the whole thing can just be vindictive. It can be by a competitor, by a patient, by an ex-spouse, could be by anybody. The board will take it, and it doesn't have to be notarized. We're going to change that. Say, no, no, complaints have to be notarized, sworn to, the truth of it. Then, if it's made up, that person committed perjury. And there are a lot of people who will lie freely, but when it comes to where they have to swear to it and sign their name to it, a lot of people say, ah, uh, maybe I won't do that. Maybe I'll do something else today. <laughs> Statue limitations. Right now, board can go back 20 years. In fact, they have. We know a doctor where they're asking for records that go back into the 80s. You don't have to keep records that long. Doctor doesn't have the records. Why are you digging up something from back in the 80s? You're going to discipline me on something that happened 20 years ago? There's no need for that. If the doctor is a bad doctor, you don't have to go back 20 years. If the doctor did something bad 20 years ago and you can't find anything since then, you shouldn't be disciplining him. Every other area of the law, we've got, these, this notion, we've got this concept called statute of limitations. And the reason we have that for virtually every crime where we cut off how far back you can go is because the further back in time you go, the less reliable the evidence. All right? We, you can't claim that your, your neighbor assaulted you 20 years ago and expect someone to prosecute on that. People pass away. People move away. People's recollections change. It's too hard to defend yourself. If you were accused of a crime 20 years ago, it's too hard to defend yourself against that. So federal law, the statute of limitations is five years for virtually everything, five years, except murder. Any federal crime that goes back beyond five years, forget it. They say, we're not going to bother with it. We're not going to prosecute it. We don't want to hear about it. In state law, it can vary. You can sometimes get six years, but you never get 20 years. All right? And there's always a limit. So we put in here, a complaint or investigation shall concern only care 
rendered within four years of the date of the complaint. All right, you go back four years, you want to complain about something, fine. You go back longer than that, forget about it. it we're not going to waste our time on it. It's not a, a good use of resources and, and the, the evidence is just not good enough for us to discipline a doctor based on it. Okay, here's another key provision we've added. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, no immunity shall attach to any complaints filed with malice or with an anti-competitive purpose. Your competitor goes after you with a complaint, sue him. We're not going to allow him to claim immunity for that. All right, someone acts against you in a malicious manner, a patient, patient says, I'm going to get you. They file a complaint, you're forced to spend $50,000 defending yourself. This provision, you can go sue that patient for doing that. It was malicious. People should not be protected with immunity for bad faith conduct. Okay, notification of the complaint. We've added a provision here that the physician shall not have to respond to a complaint until 30 days after receiving a copy of the complaint without any redaction. All right, right now, you'll get a notice from the Texas Medical Board or other states, some of you from other states, you get a notice a complaint's been filed against you alleging these violations. We want your response in, in seven days. You don't, you don't even know what the charges are. You don't know what the complaint is. You can't get a copy of the complaint. Now we change that. We say, listen, the doctor gets a full copy of the complaint, who filed it, an exact photo image, no redaction. Redaction's when they white out some of the stuff. No redaction. And then the doctor gets 30 days to respond. And then you see, hey, you know what? That's the insurance company that's been refusing to pay my bills. That's who filed this. Or they got their attorney to file it for them. Or that's my competitor down the street who's angry that all his patients are coming over to me now. That's a much easier defense. That can save you $50,000 just seeing a copy of the complaint. And it should be required. There's no reason to keep that from doctors. Now, the medical board will say, oh, it has to be anonymous because we're afraid of retaliation. Doctor will retaliate against the patient. I mean, has anyone ever heard of a doctor retaliating against a patient? I mean, what would a doctor do to a patient? I mean, it's not, the doctor's not going to retaliate the patient. Is the patient still going to the doctor? I mean, that, you know, that's another thing. I mean, if the patient's complaining, is the patient still going to the doctor? I mean, what does that tell you? All right. More good changes. More good changes. Experts. Expert physician panel. The board uses experts. Well, now we're going to put something in the law that says expert physician panel must be actively practicing medicine within Texas by having a clinical practice that accepts and sees new patients on at least a weekly basis. There's a novel idea, huh? The experts should actually practice medicine, actually be seeing patients. We got a whole cottage industry of these experts. They don't even see any patients. They're basically, they're, they're professional experts. They don't know what they're talking about and they're hired guns. Let's limit the pool of experts to doctors who are actually treating patients, right? Who could object to that? Then we get these expert physician review panels. What they can do now is if they'll, they'll send out your charts to, to an expert for review. Well, if the board doesn't like the review that came back, if the review came back and said, this doctor's fine, and that's happened a lot, the board will throw that out. You'll never see that. They'll just go and get another opinion. They'll shop for an opinion until they find an expert who really sticks the knife in you. Well, no. We say that if they send something out for an expert review and the expert review comes back favorable, the doctor should see a copy of that. That's the way it works in criminal law. In criminal law, the prosecutor has a duty to turn over anything that's exculpatory for the defendant. Well, the medical board should do the same thing. They shouldn't be able to bury stuff they don't like. And by the way, the expert report should be notarized too. The experts should sign their reports under oath. I mean, they're, they're issuing an opinion that could destroy 
the life of a doctor, his family, thousands of patients, and he's not willing to do that under oath? That opinion should be under oath. His statements and so on should be sworn to. Okay, I'll skip over some of the stuff. I won't go through every single change, but I think you'll agree that these are good. And I'll, take, I'll leave some time at the end of my talk for questions and any suggestions you may have so we can address it right away. The expert should be in the same field as the doctor being reviewed. We got to end this practice where doctors in some other field are criticizing a rival field, right? Okay. Privacy of the patients. We've had a number of patients be outraged when they learn that the likes of Keith Miller are pouring over their medical records without the patient ever consenting to it. No, shouldn't be that way. The patient records should not be disclosed unless we have their consent. We gotta stop this where all these people at the medical board are pouring over patient records and they never consented to it. Let's get their consent first. If they're not consenting, that tells you something right there. Patients were happy with the care. So let's limit these, these requests for patient records to where there's actually patient consent. After all, that's the way privacy is supposed to work. There's supposed to be a patient physician privilege. Imagine psychiatric records. And we, there was a case like that that came out of Maryland. The board insisted on psychiatric records without the consent of the patient. What a chilling effect that has. And the board has continued to fight that case for years. That's the case of Dr. Harold Eist. And AAPS filed some amicus briefs in that case on behalf of the doctor who uh, did not immediately turn over those records because he felt he did not have the patient consent. And the board has fought that and fought that. They want the power to get those records right away without patient consent. And imagine yourself as a patient, psychiatric patient. You want those records going up to the medical board if you don't approve of it? Of course not. Okay. We propose raising the standard of proof when a doctor is disciplined. Raise it to clear and convincing evidence. Not just preponderance of evidence, which means more likely than not. No, let's require they have clear and convincing evidence before they discipline a doctor. That's not even as high as the criminal standard, which is the highest, which is beyond reasonable doubt. But let's get it higher than what it is now, which is basically a flip of a coin. Is it more likely than not that a doctor did something wrong? Okay. These ISC hearings, some of you have been, have been in these things. These are the informal proceedings which were set up by the legislature so the doctor could work it out informally with the board. That's what it's supposed to be. And they make them secret, supposedly, to protect the doctor. Well, those of you who have been through these, either in this state or another state, know that they have been completely abused by medical boards, which hide behind the secrecy of the proceeding to launch into star chamber type of tactics where they, they don't let the doctor present his defense, they, they cut off the attorney and basically engage in sadistic behavior uh, in berating the doctor, threatening him with all sorts of terribles and so on. We're going to end that. We simply say that an affected physician is entitled to record or arrange for the transcription of these proceedings. Come in, let's bring in one of those video recorders like we have right here then see how that medical board behaves. All of a sudden, their abusive behavior will stop because they're on video. Or transcribe what they say and their comments, their ridiculous, outrageous comments won't happen anymore. And another benefit of this, which I've seen in one case, is that because these are panels, the, there was an, an abusive medical board member and then there was a lay member on the panel and the lay person was on the side of the doctor, apparently. And so the panel agreed to a certain level of discipline, and the doctor agreed to it, and then later the medical board imposed greater discipline than what had been agreed to at the panel. And if we had a full recording of it and tr transcription of it, the medical board wouldn't be able to dump on additional punishment as it has. 
Okay. I'll skip over some of these. Um, how about this? In the revocation of a license, the license holder has a right to a jury trial. That's what attorneys get in Texas. You can't revoke the license of an attorney in Texas without giving them a right to a jury trial. Why don't doctors get the same protection? They should. And can you imagine how different it would be if you had a jury of laypersons looking at these facts, seeing the medical board on one side and seeing the doctor trying to help patients on the other? A jury wouldn't go for half of these disciplines that the medical board is going for. A lot of these disciplines are motivated by insurance companies. Juries don't like insurance companies. That would be huge to get that protection. Okay, fee for service. The medical board should not be disciplining doctors for economic reasons. That's not quality of care. If there is an economic dispute, the medical board shouldn't be, even be involved. It's not protecting the public. It's, the doctor is, has a relationship with the patient or the insurance company. If there's a dispute there, that's what we have courts for. Right? They can sue each other, or there can be some sort of arbitration, or whatever. There's no reason why the medical board should be involved in disputes over economic matters. In some states, they're not. In Arizona, the medical board says, no, we don't get involved in economic issues. Well, let's put that into law here in Texas. Medical board won't get involved in fee disputes. It's only get involved if there's a proven likelihood of harm to a patient. That's how they justify themselves. When you look at how they justify their budget, they say, we're here to protect the public, patient safety. We're here to make sure the, the patients aren't harmed. OK, then why don't you stick to that? Stick to that purpose, right? Let's just make it part of the, the statute. How a doctor keeps his records, that's their favorite, right? When they can't find anything wrong, they'll say, well, poor record keeping, poor record keeping. They could stick that on any doctor in the state, any doctor in the country, poor record keeping was inadequate. We found some omissions here and there. Anybody could get nailed for that. Why is the medical board even getting involved in that? They shouldn't be involved in a record unless there is a likelihood of harm for the patients, right? Okay, well, we're going to be pushing to pass this model legislation. We've already started doing that. And we ask for your support in getting these enacted. And it, it is an expensive proposition when you think of hiring lobbyists, you think of the time and effort, travel and so on. So there is a financial commitment here that we've embarked upon. And we're looking to the good physicians of Texas to support that effort, many in this room and outside, so that we can get these reforms enacted. And I think you'll agree that if we just got some of these reforms passed, it would clip the power of the Texas Medical Board and set an example for the entire country where other states would begin to imitate us. We've seen other states start to imitate our lawsuit, for example. And our lawsuit against the Texas Medical Board was precedent setting because no one had done that before. And if you look at sort of the, the mainstream or established medical societies like the Texas Medical Association, they didn't join our lawsuit. They didn't testify at the hearing. We're trying to get them to support these reforms at the, uh, at the legislative level. They need to hear from you. They, there seems to be a reluctance there for them to step up to the plate and stop the abuses by the medical board. The osteopathic society in Texas is a little bit better. They've been a little more cooperative. The AMA, forget it. We've not, we can't even get the AMA to speak out about this issue. The lawsuit continues to move along. I had an a interesting deposition with Roberta Califoot's husband out in Abilene. And I'll give you some choice quotes from that. There's a pattern out there where we found that a extraordinarily high percentage of Roberta Califoot's competitors have been subjected to complaints. Okay, and I will, here is what Dan Munton wrote. My name is D Dr. Dan Munton. 
I am the former partner of Roberta Califoot D.O. and her husband, Ed Brandecker, M.D. I voluntarily, for ethical reasons, resigned from their practice in 2004. I left Abilene to serve out a contractual non-compete. In other words, Calfoot and Brandecker had him sign a non-compete. He walked away from the practice. He was then subject to a non-compete. He left town. He then planned to return. Dan writes, upon hearing of my planned return to Abilene, Ed Brandecker, that's Roberta Calfoot's husband and partner, sent me a threatening letter stating that if I had stayed away, they would have, quote, let bygones be bygones, close quote. I shortly thereafter received my first of two anonymous complaints from the Texas Medical Board, where Roberta sits as president. Then Vince Viola, my physician assistant, who previously worked for them, was also turned into the board anonymously. I don't feel this was all just coincidence. It has cost me countless hours and thousands of dollars to defend myself from these fraudulent complaints. That's a public letter. You can, in fact, it was a letter to the governor. And you can view that on the website. I asked Ed Brandecker, question, are you aware that complaints were filed against Dan Munton at the Texas Medical Board? Answer of Ed Brandecker, Roberta Califoot's husband and partner. Answer, I was aware after I saw a letter he sent to Governor Perry. Question, do you know what the source of those complaints was? Answer, I have no idea. He has no idea. No idea. Okay, well, turns out that many competitors of Calvert have had similar experiences. Okay, in one case, a doctor who I believe is going to be here this afternoon, it's the only competitor to Ed Brandecker on the designated doctor list for Brown County. A patient of this doctor saw Ed Brandecker on one day. Then a different patient of this doctor saw Dr. Califoot on the following day. Okay, so this, doc, this woman has had two patients. One went to see Ed Brandecker on Thursday, say, and another patient, different patient, went to see Roberta Califoot, Ed Brandecker's partner, on a Friday. Within days, the woman doctor, the good doctor, received a complaint that referenced both patients and had records associated with both patients. One went to see Califoot's husband, one went to see Califoot. I think there were even different insurance companies, and with days she had a complaint against her about both. The only plausible explanation is that Dr. Calfoot and Brandecker or someone acting under the direction filed the complaint. Complaint did not cite any harm to either patient, yet it has burdened the doctor for years with the harassment, the stress, the expense of defending herself. So I asked Ed Brandecker, given that all of these competitors, or nearly all of his competitors, have had complaints filed against him. And Calfoot's competitors, their partners, Brandecker and Calfoot. Question, who are your competitors? It's my question to Ed Brandecker. Answer, I, I think our practice is unique. <laughs> question, are you saying you don't have any competitors? Answer, I think the focus of our practice is unique and therefore distinguishes us from what other people do. Question, but surely you have competitors, don't you? Answer, I think you need to define what you mean, right? What the meaning of is is? Yeah. <laughs> By question, by competitor, I mean an individual has business that could go your way if that individual was not there. Answer, so can you repeat your question? <laughs> question, do you have any competitors? Answer, there are some physicians who provide some similar services. Question, I would like to introduce as Exhibit 1 a health care provider summary of designated doctors in Brown County. And this list of designated doctors lists only two doctors. A competitor of Ed Brandecker and Ed Brandecker. Okay, there are only two on the list. Ed Brandecker and someone else. Those are the only two designated doctors in Brown County at that time. 
Question, after you're looking at exhibit one, would you agree that this other doctor is a competitor of yours? Answer, I disagree. <laughs> this has got to stop. We've got to come together and we've got to reform the laws that have enabled this to happen. The lawsuit continues to go on. We're hoping for relief in the courts, but we have this window of time to change the laws themselves once and for all and clip the power, the abusive power that the medical board has had and stop this from continuing to recur. Because if we can change the statute, then there is no way the board is going to continue to be able to engage in the wrongdoing that it has been. Thank you very much.